Manscaped is here to up your body grooming game. Manscaped has the revolutionary electric trimmer, the Lawnmower 3.0. It's cordless, it's waterproof, and it's guaranteed not to nick or snag your nuts or your chest because you can use it upstairs and downstairs. So go to manscaped.com, use code HRU for 20% off plus free shipping. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. Today, I am thrilled to bring you Elle Chase, certified sexuality educator, writer, advocate, and speaker, and author of Curvy Girl Sex. Hi, Elle. How are you? Hi. Fine. How are you? I'm great. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, Thanks for having me. I've been following you on Twitter for a while. I like to like scope out my guests for a bit before. <laughs> I ask them smart. Them. Yeah, 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 believe me. Yeah. I've uh, I've asked people to come on before and then like regretted it. Yeah. Or especially in these like volatile times, um, there's been a couple of people that I were talking about coming on to the podcast and then kind of coronavirus set in and the world went crazy. Yeah. And then I saw the things that these people were putting on Twitter and I was like, Yeah. Oh, dodged a bullet. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not so much, but yeah, you are uh, wonderful in so many ways. I love having sex educators on yes. just because I think it's um, such a wonderful thing to talk about the education behind sex. You know, on this podcast, we obviously talk about sex all the time because it's really kind of about the adult industry. But I like to throw in a little education, yeah, you know, here and there, why you know, teach why not? people a couple of things. Why not? So um, having people on you like you on is always just like a great treat for me. So let's start off with maybe telling us how you got into sex education, maybe even giving us a little bit of what your sex education was maybe growing up. I know that most people have such a poor um, sex education background and that's kind of what inspires some people to get into teaching other people about it. So what's your story? Yeah. Um, I didn't really get any sex education when I was growing up. I grew up in a very liberal, um, half hippie, half half scientist family. So <laughs> both sides were were sort of avoiding the subject. Um, but what uh, what got me into sex ed is uh, I got a divorce when I was forty, and I realized I had never enjoyed sex. I didn't know what the big deal was. And so I went to sort of explore that through porn and through Tumblr porn specifically. And um, I found myself a lover <laughs> and we would send pictures back and forth and um, and people. And then we would then I started LadyCheeky.com, which was my Tumblr site where I posted pictures and we would post pictures to each other of things we wanted to do with each other, things that were interesting. Um, and then people found the Tumblr site and started looking at it and following and then started sending me questions. And I'm like, I don't fucking know. <laughs> I'm posting porn on a social media site. Don't ask me. And so, wait a minute, wait a minute. From my experience on social media, <laughs> I make you an expert on all things. Oh, all things, everything. So I started to look things up. The daughter of a scientist, you know, I want to make sure that I get my my facts straight. So uh, I would look things up and then I would send answers back and they were just coming in and I was answering back and I got really into it and I found sort of a passion for it as I was finding my passion. And um, so I became a big advocate for women owning their sexuality and getting rid of that shame and liking porn and feeling comfortable in their bodies and knowing that they're sexy and sensual regardless of what they look like or what they think they look like. Mm. Um and uh, and that's what sort of keeps me going and gets me gets me up in the morning, I suppose. I love that through trying to educate other people, you self-educated. And so it was kind of like a growing together experience. Exactly. And I, yeah. And I also really like that this didn't start until 40. I think so many people 
um, mistakenly believe that like your sexual peak is really in like your twenties and your thirties. And after that, you're supposed to just be, I don't know, a mom or a spinster, you know what I mean? That, that you never can engage in any kind of fun sexual exploration past a certain age. And so I love that you're really dispelling that myth. Yeah. I mean, I didn't enjoy sex until I was 40 when I found that, um, that lover and, um, I wasn't okay with my body for 40 years. And I realized, you know, at 40, finally, that, it, that it doesn't really matter, uh, how big you are, how skinny you are, what's going on. It is your sense of your sexuality and your sensuality and your enjoyment of that, that is what's attractive to other people and what you connect to in yourself when you're having um, really great sex. Yeah, that I have to say, so I had Carla Lane on a uh-huh. while back. And if any of you guys want to go check out my interview with her, it's fantastic. So she is a self-described BBW performer. She's a curvier girl and she has more self-confidence than so many other women that I've shot, you know, I've shot a lot of like thin, slim girls. That's kind of always been like my genre more in, in that, in that glamour kind of yeah. or niche. But I have to tell you, talking to Carla was so inspiring because this girl just exudes so much confidence and she's Mm -hmm. truly comfortable in her own skin and she loves it and she flaunts it. And I found myself so jealous of her because, you know, it's like ironic. It's, you know, to be a woman, I think we get so many mixed messages about our bodies. And, you know, I've always been on, I've always been in the stage where I'm like, always trying to just lose 10 pounds Mm -hmm. and I'm like, okay, where I'm at. Like I've never had like a huge weight battle, but I've never been super comfortable with how I look. And, um, I was talking to Carla. I'm like, God, I wish I could just shed all of that and just love myself the way I like you are heavier than me and you are so much more confident in your body and your sexuality than I've ever been. Mm. And, you know, it's interesting too. We always, we have this real like body dysmorphia when we're in that state. And now that I'm almost nine months pregnant, I look back at, at pictures and video of myself from literally nine months ago when I thought I was fat and I was like, I was so skinny. What is wrong with me? Yeah. And it's just like, but I've always felt that way in high school. I was, you know, 15 pounds lighter. And I thought I was fat then. It's just like, yeah, well, we're made, we're, it's that sort of collective amnesia. We're made to feel that way by everything we see. And it is, I mean, I'm not going to get too political about the patriarchy and all of that, but (laughs) I will say that, you know, we're not born hating our bodies. So Mm -hmm. what happens between, I don't know, we're about the age of three when we start to realize that people have opinions and we can do good things and that we get happy faces and we do bad things and we get frowns. And, um, you know, what happens after that that makes us feel that way? And um, when you look around, you can start, when you start to dismantle a diet culture like that, you can start to see how everybody is really, it sounds corny, but it's true, is sexy and beautiful in their own way. I truly believe that. Um, I mean, I, I have felt disgusting and gross and tied up in rope and naked with all of my folds coming out. And my boyfriend was like, you've never looked more beautiful. Mm. You know, so it's like, who are we to tell them what to be attracted to or what or what they feel is sexy to give yeah. them some sort. It's like someone saying to, uh, I was on a panel once, someone was saying, oh, you know, we need to help the porn actresses because they're just all, um, they come from broken homes. Otherwise they wouldn't be in porn. We need to, we need to help them. And it's like, why don't you give um, people just agency over their own body? How about that? And how about you don't judge them? Because you don't know, you know what I mean? It's like most of the women I know are perfectly happy and love their jobs. It's yeah. like any other job, right? So how can we say to our <clears throat> to our loved one, to our partner, to whatever that um, that we are gross and that we're unsexy, and, and you know how can they want us? Because they do, and you just have to sort of give them that respect, if that makes sense. 
Do you think that it's more like a female driven judgment than a male driven judgment? I find that like, I don't know, my experience, it seems to me, and maybe I'm just seeing it wrong that like women tend to judge weight gain or loss more so than like men seem to be kind of just happy with sexuality and confidence. Um, Like I, I feel like I've never had a man make me feel fat, but I've had women make me feel fat. Well, I think, I, I think it is, again, it's sort of a, an amnesia. It's kind of like, um, I don't see that's a political thing again. I don't want to get into the politics, but I think it is this, this feeling that we have to be a certain way mm-hmm. and we have to, and we feel so poorly about ourselves that it makes us feel better when we judge somebody else. So what I mm-hmm. say in my classes is that, when you are judging someone else, you're really judging yourself. Yeah. So if I'm walking down the street and I'm like, she should not be wearing those pants. Mm-hmm. Um, I have to go, hmm, I'm wondering why I am very judgy about that particular, well, it's because I'm feeling really bloated today. Mm-hmm. You know, and we're used to, we have been pitted against each other um, in competitions and just in, in life. So I think that that's a big part of it too. But I think also men are, uh, I think there are more men that, uh, than we think there are that really appreciate different types of bodies. I think there is a lot of pressure put on, um, heterosexual, um, cis men to, uh, to conform to what society wants to see, wants them to be with. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they definitely have their own pressures as well in terms of like yeah. what they should look like and how Absolutely. they should be and how they should behave and how much money they should have and what car they mm-hmm. should drive. So all these societal pressures that, you know, we see directed at women's bodies that we as, you know, females may be struggling with, you know, men have their own slew of issues that they have to deal with. So I definitely see all of that. So I want to go back to how you said that once you started, you met this lover that you started to embrace and love your body and open up to your own sexuality. What was it specifically about your experience with this person that, that made you feel that way? He was very gentle with me and I like didn't take my nightgown off for three months and he was very gentle, very patient, and just kept saying to me, I, I find you sexy. I find you, I'm very attracted to you. I'm this, I'm, you know, and he said to me one day, which was kind of revolutionary for me. He said, you could put a supermodel in front of me and then you put a 350 pound woman next to her. And if the supermodel doesn't have a sense of her sexuality, but the 350 pound woman does, I'll go for the 350 pound woman every time. Mm. And so he said, there is something inherently uh, a turn on about seeing a woman confident in her own sexuality or owning it even, even if you're not super confident about, but just owning, I'm a sexual being. And I think that's what, you know, Carla Carla definitely exudes that as does April Flores, you know, um, just this, Hey, I'm, I'm a sexual being and I love it. And, uh, and I'm here, I'm here for it, you know? So I think that that little analogy also did it for me because I really could understand that. Mm -hmm. Um, so let's talk about being uh, a curvier woman or being a bigger man and uh, talking about how sex can be better for, because, you know, so often we see sex embodied and especially, you know, in my genre, I mean, I'll be, you know, I admit, like I, like I said before, I tend to shoot very like standard mainstream, very, you know, slim people. So um, if we're talking to people who are, uh, have bigger bodies, what are some of the positions that they can really enjoy? And um, what are some ways that they can improve their sex life? And could any of these positions perhaps be helpful to a woman who is eight and a half months pregnant and is having (laughs) a hard time getting off the couch? Yes. Well, you know, uh, my book actually has a color key and one of the keys is for pregnant women. And so when you see that in the book, you'll know that it's a for 
for pregnant women because you can't do everything because there's something in there. You can't squish it, you know? There sure <laughs> is. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. That's, that's a solid, that's a solid uh, human being in there. Um, yes. I mean, my book is curvy girl sex, but it really can be used for anyone with whatever genitals you have. Um, I find the doggy style is a wonderful, wonderful um, position to augment and to try when you are coming from behind or whether you're the receiver. Um, if you're coming from behind and you have a big stomach, you can lift up the stomach. Um, you can also spread the cheeks of the person that you're fucking. Um, and the person who is receiving it, um, everything's sort of hanging down, so nothing's getting in the way. Uh, I'm also a big believer in pillows and I really like not just pillows from the house that you might have, but like taking the pillows off the couch cause that has a denser foam in it. But also, um, liberator sex furniture is something that it, it, like, I just think everyone should have regardless of their, of their size. It just makes sex so much easier. Sometimes you're talking about like those sex wedges, right? Sex that you wedges. can like. Oh, yeah. The, yeah. Yeah. It's, so it's like literally like a big, long wedge, wedge of cheese <laughs> and you just sort of stick it underneath their hips with the thinner side down towards um, your torso and the wider end towards your hips. And it lifts the hips up so that all of the skin or tummy or whatever that's around the genitals sort of falls away like um, gravity sort of helps it out. And, um, and also it really helps like a bad back or, um, if you're coming at it from a doggy style and you want to lay down on it, it gives you relief for sore arms. They're great for everything. And when you're not using it, um, I at least use it as a, as a laptop desk <laughs> put it there and just put it on. So, you know, multi, multi use. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Oh my God. Yeah. That that is great. Um, do you have any tips for women who might be not feeling their sexuality and what they could do to feel more sexy in the bedroom, um, feel more confident in their own body? Yeah, there are a few things. Um, I think one is getting in, in touch with your sensuality, getting in touch with all of those five senses and what you can control outside your body that will make you feel sexy or at least help you get to that place. So it's, um, it's massage. It's, if you are, um, if you react to scents, it's candles, music. Um, what is your, uh, what are your surroundings? So that's one thing. Another thing too, that I'm a big proponent of, and you'll like this cause you're a photographer. Um, is taking boudoir photos. I did this with a um, photographer named Nick Holmes. And uh, I went in never being naked in front of like any man that I didn't know. And I was 250 pounds and I went in without makeup and I had to have a drink, but <laughs> it was okay. And um, he made me feel fantastic and sexy and wonderful. And I've never felt more... I don't know, sort of delicious in an artificial scenario, you know? Mm -hmm. And I look at those pictures now and I can feel how embodied that sexuality was. So mm -hmm. I really, really recommend finding someone you feel very comfortable with um, to, to take a set, a set of sexy pictures um, and get into that mood. Um, I really like that idea. Uh, it's also looking at porn. I mean, that was it for me too, is looking at porn and seeing what, um, what turned me on and what I wanted to do made me feel more sexual and made me masturbate more. And the more you masturbate, you sort of get all of those, uh, the oxytocin and the dopamine and all of that going. So, yeah. Yeah. I've, um, I like all of those things. I have shot boudoir photos for like normal people, um, in the past and the experience for them, I have to say, 
well, it was, clearly it was fantastic because they were working yes. with me. No, I'm just kidding. But like, actually, it was really lovely for me because, you know, I'm used to shooting professional models, mm-hmm. which granted is easier because I have to give them less direction because they know what they're mm-hmm. doing. Yeah. But, you know, it's like they've done it a million times and, um, you know, it's not as special as it was to, you know, these wives right. whose husbands bought them the special mm-hmm. photo package and the excitement and the enthusiasm and also like the vulnerability vulnerability. Yes. Just really endearing. And I really, it was good for me because it really like kind of made me slow down and be like, okay, I got to make sure that I'm really like making this person feel good and paying attention Mm -hmm. to them and making them feel beautiful and coaching them in a way that um, will make them look their best, but also not make them feel um, awkward. Mm -hmm. And just their response to the final product was so incredible because yeah yeah, it really was in a way that you know it's not for me in terms of like my normal shoots like just how happy they were about the photos and how amazing it made them feel and how grateful their husbands were and like you know there's a couple of them that will reach out to me every so often and be like you know it's been x many years and i still like really treasure that experience and these photos and like thank you so much i know and it made me feel so good about you know doing something that could make somebody feel so good about themselves. So I I agree with you. I think the boudoir photo thing is a really wonderful experience. And uh, for those of you who are watching and you're like, oh, I want to do that. um, I can recommend some great photographers to you. Not saying that, that I don't do it anymore, but I'm about to go into on maternity leave. I'm not gonna be shooting for like probably the rest of the year. So, um, but if anybody wants to reach out, I can give you recommendations for really wonderful people who are great at that. So, okay, we're going to take a quick commercial break. We're going to come back. We're going to talk about busting sex myths. We're going to talk a little bit more about porn and how it can enhance your life and Elle's favorite uh, picks for that and so much more. So just hang on. We'll be right back. Summer is here and Manscaped is here to help you level up your full body grooming game. Their Lawnmower 3.0 is a revolutionary electric trimmer. It's cordless, it's waterproof, and it is guaranteed not to nick or snag your nuts. And if you want to use it on your chest hair, it actually has different settings so you can get the perfect length, whether or not you're the kind of guy who likes to be a little bearish or maybe actually wants a bare chest, literally. You can get all of this inside the perfect package where you will find the crop preserver, an anti-chafing ball deodorant and moisturizer, as well as the crop reviver, a testy toner that is designed to give you a pep in your step. If you subscribe to the perfect package, you will get a blade refill for your lawnmower trimmer delivered to your door every three months. So what are you waiting for? Make this your best and most hairless summer ever. Go to manscaped.com, use code HRU for 20% off plus free shipping. That's manscaped.com, use code HRU for 20% off plus free shipping. Hey, everybody, we are back. So, Elle, I want to go back to um, what you were talking about earlier about how watching porn can actually help you amp up your sex life. And since this is the industry that I work in for a living, um, I love to hear from people who don't actively work specifically in the porn industry, their opinions about porn and what kind of porn they like to watch and what they would recommend. So what are some of your recommendations? Um, I like uh, Bright Desire. Okay. Um, Can you tell us a little bit about what each website is? Because I actually don't know that one. Oh, this is a woman, I think her name is Louise Lush, and she is based in Australia, and she does a lot of, you know, porn for women. So it's Mm -hmm. very um, sort of um, regular bodies and average people and directs them in a very sensual and um, yet hot way. Like she Mm -hmm. really gets that desire and that passion. Um, and then there's Frolic Me. I believe she's in England. I forgot her name, but Frolic Me is just a beautiful site. It's sort of very stylized and kind of very modern and stylized, like in a gorgeous vintage car out in the wheat fields. <laughs> and, I um, love stuff you know, like that. Yeah. And two like really good looking people getting together and just having this amazing sex. Um, I really do. I do like 
frolic me a lot. And then there's Erica Lust, which you reminded me about, of course, uh, who is the sort of the OG. Um, her, her stuff, she is in Spain and uh, her stuff is also, but it, her stuff is very, um, I want to say it's very earthy, yet it is also really sort of experimental. It's definitely, uh, it's definitely sort of a new way of looking at all different kinds of sex with all different kinds of genders and sexualities and all that kind of stuff. And incredibly, incredibly sexy. Um, yeah, she does some great stuff. She's also started um, hiring a lot of uh, directors to create stuff for her. I know Casey Calvert, um, who's another previous guest on my podcast. Also, Eric Lust has been on as well, of course. So if you guys want to go back and, and check that out, um, you can hear from both of them. But uh, Casey Calvert's been uh, directing for Erica lately. And so like she's really kind of expanding her empire, but yeah. she's very particular about who directs for her. Um, mostly females from what I understand and, you know, but just getting different people's visions. And um, so it's a really and stuff. Yeah. yeah. It's a fascinating collective of, yeah. of different kinds of, and you're right. Like there was, I don't know. Did you go to her um, when she was out here? She I did like a screening. I was sick as a dog. I uh, know. Uh, I went to that and there was just some really cool stuff in there, you know, um, yeah. made me realize how like, pigeonholed my own porn is and how all my stuff looks the same and a lot of what I see looks the same and there was this one with like uh I think they it was it was like uh they were um doing pottery so it was like a lot of clay mm. and they had sex with all this clay over their bodies which was mm. and that the audio was really like intense you know and it makes you you forget how a lot of people forget that audio is like half Huge. Yeah. The battle it's huge and a lot of people yeah. are lazy with the audio and there was a lot yeah. of like like just the noises of the body compounded by the the clay and it was just so cool and i remember watching it going wow i would have never thought of this yeah she is a she's an artist she is a filmmaker and yeah. um she just happens to do erotic films um and you see actually i just thought of another one is the hump festival dan savage's hump festival which is now i think virtual I've gone the past four years, I think, and the creativity and the, it, it is, it's, you, it, you will never see porn like this ever. And it is, it's really, really inspiring. Yeah. And it's, you know, and one of the things that I really try to stress on this podcast, um, is that porn is not just one thing. Cause I get so many people who think it's like, it's just like, the rough gang bangs I see on Pornhub, which is like yeah. fine if that's your thing, you yeah. know, but like porn is not just one thing. Porn is so many different things. And the internet has really allowed this incredible space for people to come in and create all different kinds of porn that apply to all different kinds of people, Yeah, which is just really wonderful. And actually going back to um, what we were talking earlier about, you know, bigger bodies and curvy girl sex. Do you feel that, because I think that um, the porn industry has actually been better about embracing um, different size bodies than mainstream media has been. And I feel like mainstream media is only now just sort of catching up like a little bit. I mean, not that that porn is, is perfect and needs no changes whatsoever. And we're, you know, great at everything that we do, but I haven't noticed that when you allow this space for people to really explore and look for what they want, which is what the internet allowed people mm -hmm. that, um, you saw, a, you know, like the BBW genre really spike. I mean, Carla Lane was saying like how actually, you know, she's almost not big enough for BBW and that, um, these girls just make so much money and they have like really hardcore fans who absolutely love, um, what they do. I mean, how they look. And it made me kind of think about how before the internet came along, I think we all were so narrow focused on like, this is what, cause mainstream media was always feeding us. Yeah. This is what you should look like. This is what like, sexy looks like this is what beautiful looks like and we didn't really have other alternatives to that very narrow-minded mindset and then the internet came along and all of a sudden people could look for things that they actually truly yeah loved and wanted to explore and so i feel like 
I don't know. I feel like the internet kind of opened that up for people, but especially in, in porn, because porn's always like been at the forefront of like all that stuff. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think it was a confluence of a few things. I think that uh, mainstream media started to, with the, with the internet started to really take notice that fat people were getting upset. They didn't have enough choices with, um, with clothes that they wanted more representation and all of that. And I think what the porn industry did is they always had BBW porn, or at least from when I was looking at it. Um, but I think they started to rebrand it in a less, um, objectified way. Mm -hmm. And that was really great because instead of going to, you know, when you would go and buy DVDs of, you know, you know, big whale butt sex or something like that, you know, I saw like whale sex or, and it was just big women. Now it's just like BBW or Mm -hmm. it's, you know, Carla Lane and you know what you're getting. April Flores, you know what you're getting. And, and they are, you're right. They're huge. They have a huge fan base. And, um, so I think that's, I think, and I think also the Tumblr before it became a G rated platform, boring, um, also helped that out too, because it showed the world that there was, uh, more space for erotic content that wasn't in just one lane Mm -hmm. and that, and it gave people the freedom to search for whatever their kink was and whatever their size preference is and um, whatever their aesthetic is um, to validate their own sexuality. And I, and I think that um, mainstream porn really um, benefited from that too, because you can love mainstream porn. I love mainstream porn. I watch it myself um, but the, they're starting to see, or they have started to see that there is such a diverse amount of porn out there and an audience for everyone that it's kind of exciting. Yeah. Okay. I want to, uh, switch gears here a little bit and talk about, um, busting sex myths, which yes. was a blog that you recently wrote on your website, lchase.com. Yes. Mm-hmm. And, um, there was one in particular that, uh, I really loved because I find that it is a myth that, you know, I come across in, um, my comments and just in general all the time from people who think that everybody in porn must have a massive vagina because one of the myths that you bring up is that, um, the more sex you have, the looser your vagina becomes. So can you explain to people why this is not the case? Um, your vagina does not stretch there. There is erectile tissue on the inside and it, it contracts and it, it opens and contracts just like any other body part would except a little bit more when there's blood flow to it. When people think that there is a loose vagina, it might be because the kegels aren't strong enough or they are just expecting a clamp on a penis. The vagina does not stretch out. The vagina is, it's almost like, if you want to say, you know, does your mouth stretch wide open? Do you stretch out your mouth because you talk and you eat so much? No, it goes back to its normal state. It goes back to its natural state. And, you know, like the penis, nothing happens to the penis however many times you're fucking somebody like there's no abrasions, there's no stretched out scrotum from, you know, fucking 25 women in a week or something, you know? So, uh, so yeah, so that is a big myth. And I think it, it perpetuates this feeling of, um, mothers are, it desexualizes mothers because Mm. it says, Oh, you've had children. So you must be all stretched out and not tight anymore. Like, well, no, that's not the case, you know, with, and, you know, with women who have had children, the Kegel muscles, uh, might need to be a little bit strengthened because they have to loosen a little bit to let the baby out. But other than that, it goes right on back. So. Yeah. I, I can tell you from, you know, being heavily pregnant that one of the things I have to do a lot is work on my Kegel muscles simply because it, it's best to be able to control. And, and actually one thing that my doula was pointing out was not necessarily the tightening, but the learning to loosen because you really want to allow yourself to open yes. up so the baby can come out. Yes. So it kind of works both ways. It's all about like controlling, 
um, you know, your vagina and, you know, how, how flexible complex. it can be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah exactly. Coxedial, uh, coxedial complex down there. And the more you're, the more you know about it and the more you're able to control it, um, uh, the, the healthier you'll be, you'll be able to stop the, the flow of pee better. You'll be mm -hmm. able to, um, to contract, um, at will whenever you want to, yeah. um, instead of just letting it, letting it lie. So, yeah. Um, and then, uh, the other two that you talked about was, um, lubricants mm -hmm. and why you might want to consider using lubricant, even if you think you don't need it. Mm -hmm. Um, because I think another, uh, suggestion that lube is really only for people who aren't turned on or, um, people who, you know, experience vaginal dryness for whatever reason. I actually had a, uh, one of my really good friends once said something to me that always like stuck with me. And I get kind of, um, when I was dating, I would get self-conscious about it. And he would say something like, you know, my girlfriend, like she's just, she's never like wet right away. And it just makes me feel like she's not into me. He's like, I just want to date somebody who's, you know, like the minute I touch them, they have like a sopping wet vagina. And that like, wouldn't happen for me. You know what I mean? Like I generally don't get turned on like that. Like it takes a while for me to get there. And I remember feeling like I had this weird kind of intrinsic shame that like, I couldn't yeah. like get wet immediately. And the idea of using lube was almost like, admitting defeat or something crazy yeah. like that. Yeah. You know, a lot of women feel this way and it is so normal. I can't even tell you, um, you know, we all have different types of desire and Emily Nagoski in her book, come as you are talks about responsive desire and spontaneous desire. And, and what you're describing is responsive desire. You need a little, you know, play beforehand. You need something stimulated before you get, before you get wet. And that doesn't mean that you're not going to have spontaneous desire sometimes. But regardless, lube is like the greatest invention ever. Because first of all, there are not many people that can just lubricate, lubricate, lubricate and not have it dry out at some point. Mm. Adding lube will help that and it will help keep things going. And with most water-based lubes, you can just add water to it and it reactivates. With silicone, it just stays slippery forever. It's so fabulous. I even love giving blowjobs with silicone. I must have like ingested about four oil drums <laughs> of silicone in my entire life. But, um, but you know, people are like, oh, don't, don't eat the silicone. It's not going to kill you. But, <laughs> but it really makes everything so slippery and it, it just feels so good. So the lube makes everything nice and, and warm and fuzzy there, um, for a longer period of time. And, uh, you know, it, it also abates sort of micro tears. If the, um, if the wetness is not so prevalent and you're in the middle of sex and it's starting to hurt a little bit, add lube. You don't want to get little micro tears in there as well. So I don't know if I'm even describing this right, but, um, <laughs> So that's why I love lube. I think lube just makes everything better. Um, it makes it do you have any mm -hmm. Do you have any favorite brands that you would recommend? I do. I like Sutil, which is a um, Canadian brand, I think, and they make uh, water-based. I also like Uber Lube for silicone. Uber Lube's great. Um, yeah, I love Uber Lube. And then there's this new brand of... CBD lube called Go Love that I really like a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're into that, that's a really that's a really good one. And I just want to let um, my listeners know, for those of you who maybe aren't as experienced with lube or have used lube in the past and had some kind of adverse reaction to it, different kinds of lube can give you different reactions. Yes. So if you've used it once and it burned or something like that, that doesn't mean that you can never use lube. It just means you were using the wrong kind. Um, I will say like going and buying the cheap lube, I have found just because we use so much lube on our sets, the cheap lube, like KY or something like that from yeah. the store is not, is that not ideal? Um, it can get sticky and some people are allergic to like silicone lube. Um, and they need to use water-based lube. Um, and so there's different kinds of lube. So try, if you've tried one kind of lube and it didn't work, try different variations because there will be something that works best for you. That's a really good point, actually, because there are some people who tend to get um, yeast infections a lot. 
And so yeah. you want to look for glycerin as an ingredient to avoid. Um, there's no science to back it up, but there's plenty of anecdotal evidence that it sort of helps a uh, yeast infection appear. Um, and also look for lube that has the least amount of ingredients. That's always mm -hmm. your best bet. And even if it says organic, just look for the least amount of ingredients. And then, um, and then you should- like this it's like the same with food. Yes. You know, exactly. the less ingredients it has, like the more, yeah, yeah. whole it is. Yeah. Whole lube instead of whole like whole lube. food. Instead That's of whole right. foods, whole lubes. <laughs> whole lubes. Start a whole, whole store. <laughs> and then uh, the other thing that you mentioned was condom sizes and how there's a belief that there's only two condom sizes, magna and, um, and regular, but you mm -hmm. say that's not true. No, actually, there's plenty of companies that make different sizes. Um, and you can be, you know, average, medium, large, extra large. And uh, there is this uh, toilet paper roll test. So if you get the toilet paper roll and stick an erect penis into the roll, and if there's room, then you are the regular size. If, uh, if, there, if you're just fitting in there and you can get it in, but it's touching the sides, that's your large large to extra large. Um, and if you can't fit it in at all, why then that's the extra large magnums. <laughs> and then I believe you said that the average was if there was a good amount of room yeah. around, yeah. right? Yeah. And then just because I know that guys ask me this all the time, I actually, one of my most popular clips on my YouTube channel mm -hmm. is Nicole Aniston talks about her favorite penis size. And she says average. And almost every comment is what is average? Cause you know, like we have such a hang up about penis size. So yeah. average is what, like five inches, I think. Yeah. Right? It's like the no, median yeah. five, four to six, mm -hmm. um, is, is the median. Yeah. And that, that really is average. I mean, yeah. that is what the average dick is. Yeah. And, uh, and it's, just as satisfying as a big dick, at least in my personal experience. It's the, it's all about the lover and not the uh, apparatus. I mean, I will tell you from personal experience, I actually don't like really huge penises. I've only had a couple of them and I find that um, they are, after a while, they can be a little bit painful. Yeah. Um, and they're just, uh, they're a lot to handle. And I know like some women love it. Um, which is great, but uh, contrary to popular belief, I, I agree with you. I penis yeah. size is not something that I really care about. I know that I have a friend of mine who had a lover who had just this, had a huge, huge, wide, long dick, and rough sex was really hard for them. Yeah, because because there were all these tears and there was less staying power with mm -hmm. um, with someone that had sort of your average size penis. So, so that could be a thing as well too. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, from experience of shooting guys with really large penises for a long time, I will tell you that sometimes when they're really, really big, they have a harder time getting fully erect because so much blood is to go in yes. there, yeah. you know, and uh, yeah, it can actually make the scene a lot more difficult um, for the girl. And and not as sexy and they have to take breaks and we have to use a lot of lube. Mm -hmm. Um, I remember I had Rob Piper on, uh, the podcast, he's got a large penis and he was saying like, sometimes it's actually like kind of detrimental to have a huge penis because yeah. some girls are just like, this is too much for me. So yeah. the grass is not always greener people. Always I'm greener. just saying. Yeah. <laughs> you know, mm. So where can people find these different size condoms? Because I think they're just used to going to the store and seeing like the Magnums and the ah, regulars. There is this amazing company. This is where I get all my condoms. Luckybloke.com. And you can buy, you can just sort of like make your own package. And they have a, um, they have a great array of different sizes, different kinds, different everything. They have every condom you could possibly want. And so you can try out all these different ones instead of buying like a box here or a box there. Um, and uh, if you use Lady Cheeky in the code, I think you still get 20% off maybe. I don't know. Ooh, uh, everybody ooh. likes a little 20% off. 20% so. off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they have, uh, they have lube samples that you can get too. So you can try different lubes. Oh, fantastic. So this is my favorite place. There's also a really wonderful condom called the Unique Condom. Mm 
Mm. And it's made out of this material that's kind of like a grocery bag material. And you put it on a dry dick, a hard dry dick, and you, you put it down and then it sort of shrink wraps onto the dick. And it is so thin and it's almost indestructible. And it feels to me like there's no condom on. And I've never heard of this. They're Canadian and they sell them at Lucky Bloke. They're Canadian, but uh, Europe has been making a version of them for a long time. And I forgot the name, I think for the past 10, 15 years. And they just, this unique condom company just can't get the FDA to approve them here, but they've passed the FDA in Canada so they can... They can make them in Canada. I know. Well, it costs, a, it costs like $200,000 here to get something cleared. Right. Yeah. So, but at any rate. I bet you say. Trojans behind it. It's yeah. probably a big conspiracy. It's, it's like the pharmaceutical is. companies. I know. You know. It's like trying to probably block it. Is. <laughs> Damn it. Um, but I highly recommend them and they make, they make your average size and then they make um, a large size too. And I, and they come in a little um, like, thin credit card shape so they're very thin and you you zip it out and then you put it on and it's great oh wow so you can kind of like sneak them in your wallet and be super low-key about it so you know it doesn't have to be that really awkward situation where you go to a girl's house and you bring condoms just in case but then it doesn't happen but somehow it Mm -hmm. accidentally falls out and she was like oh you were expecting something you were expecting like real discreet i like that it looks like a black card if you put it in your credit card holder. Ooh. Like card. Oh, wow. That's fancy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, we're going to take one more quick commercial break, and then we're going to come back and we're going to talk about uh, ways to revamp your sex life if you happen to be stuck in a rut. So hang on. We'll be right back. If you're here, it's probably because you're a fan of my podcast, Holly Randall Unfiltered. Well, that's great because I'm a fan of my podcast too. Now, if you don't know what Patreon is, it's a crowdfunding platform that allows people to make contributions on a monthly basis. Because this podcast costs money to make, maybe even more so than others. I'm obsessed with quality. So since the beginning, I have always recorded in a studio, had a professional sound engineer, and recorded professional video. All of these things cost money, as you can imagine. And I also made a pretty scary decision this year to cut down on my directing gigs so that I could focus more on this podcast, which is why I need your help now more than ever. But don't worry, I'm not asking you to give me something for nothing. In exchange for your contributions, I offer so many perks. For example, access to the live streams of all of my interviews, a bonus podcast that I do called My LA Porn Life, Q and A's where the stars answer your specific questions, behind the scenes interviews, merchandise such as mugs, shirts, and stickers, access to my private Snapchat, and so much more. You can join for as little as $5 a month and help me change the way the world sees the adult industry and sex work. So take a look around and see everything that I have to offer. I really hope that you'll join and be a part of our little community. All right, we are back. So one of the um, most interesting articles on your blog that you read that personally captivated my interest, um, because, you know, I've been with my husband for a while, is uh, ways to revamp your sex life. Because we've all, you know, I think gotten stuck in a rut uh, every once in a while. Mm -hmm. And you had a couple of different ways to... Um, get out of that rut. Mm -hmm. Let's start with, I think let's just start with the porn angle only because we've kind of already talked extensively about porn. So Mm -hmm. we don't have to go back into too much detail about that, but how could porn help you revamp your sex life? Well, porn is great for arousal. I think people think of porn as great for masturbation and you come and you're done, right? But porn um, can be used to watch with your partner and you can look at different kinds of porn and sort of discuss what you like about it, what you don't like about it. And the visual of it will probably start to arouse both of you. And especially if it's something that you're not used to doing, I think it's, it's a bonding exercise. It's also very intimate, I think, to watch porn with somebody because it's something we normally do on our own. And when you're doing it with a partner, I think it's uh, bonding. 
and it also opens up that conversation. I was just going to ask if um, you think that it opens up the the dialogue for talking about maybe new things you want to try, different things you want to do. So rather than having to like, you know, just kind of bring something up randomly, maybe if you see something in a movie, you can be like, that looks interesting. Would you ever Mm -hmm. want to try that? Or how do you feel about that? It helps communication because there are a lot of people that, that have kinky fantasies and stuff they might want to try with a partner, but they're, they just don't know how to say it. And so porn's a great way to communicate some fantasies that you've had. Maybe you're interested in kink, but you don't know how to bring it up with your partner. So finding some porn clips that kind of are interesting to you and then saying, hey, let's look at this together. And then that brings up the conversation. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a great conversation starter. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I've found that, that to be true. And in my life, when I tell people <laughs> what I do for a living. <laughs> yes. Um, and actually, one of the websites that you mentioned before we went on air was Peter Hager because he yes. does those those tantric massage videos, which leads us to one of your uh, other yes. um, pointers, which was literally a erotic tantric massage. So yeah. can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, I love tantric massage. It's called um, yoni or lingam massage, yoni being the vagina and lingam being the penis. And I find it incredibly, an incredible turn on. It's my favorite type of porn to watch personally. But um, what you do is the person who is receiving the massage, it's genital massage. So the person who's receiving the massage just lays back and their whole job is to just receive pleasure and to do it without reciprocation. So whatever happens that night, the person who's receiving it is receiving it and there is no reciprocation. Um, The goal of this is not to have an orgasm. The goal of it is to sort of track your arousal and also, you know, guide your partner into what feels good. Let them feel that area. Um, Let your partner feel your penis, massage the penis. Um, And, you know, oftentimes when this happens, just so you know, is penises don't get hard, even if you're playing with it. And that's totally normal. Um, Because again, it's not about getting hard. It's not about coming. It's about really being in your body and receiving that pleasure. It's so hard for us to do that because we're thinking about all this other stuff. But if we just hone in on it, and um, it, it's incredibly, incredibly erotic, um, as is mutual masturbation, which is another one of my favorites. So, mm. yeah. So are you saying really that like sexual intimacy could possibly involve, or I should, sorry, I should say not involve the genitals or not involve like, cause we have such a very specific idea about what sex is. Sex is the penis gets hard, the vagina gets wet, the penis goes in the vagina, yeah. Or, you know, um, if you were talking about same sex, whatever the combination might be, right. both people orgasm or in most cases, maybe the guy just orgasms. Right. Right. And, then, yeah. <laughs> and that, and then that, and that's sex, but you're right. saying sex could be, doesn't have to be specifically that follow that path. That's right. Sex does not have to be penetrative. It doesn't have to be oral. It can be just feeling and giving each other pleasure. And sex doesn't have to end with an orgasm for it to be sex. Um, Mm. as long as you are, uh, enjoying yourself, then I think, you know, I think you're there. It's, Mm. it doesn't have to always be from A to B. It can, Mm -hmm. the fun is in the journey of it. The fun is in exploring different ways of pleasure. And you never know, there are points in your body that you may never think would be an erogenous zone, but you try it and you go, Hmm, like I didn't discover until I was 45 that the inside of my wrists were like really sensitive and were great during sex, like to be, yeah. <laughs> if you think about it, the parts of your body that don't get touched by anyone else on a normal mm. basis, right? So like the inside of your thighs or right behind mm. your earlobes, or for some people, it's their armpits, their inner elbow right here, the inside of their elbow. All those areas are very, very sensitive. And if you spend a lot of time on them, um, you know, your partner could really, really enjoy that. Yeah. I found honestly, my most erogenous zone is right the back of my neck and the back of my shoulders. Mm. Like that for me is, is I can almost orgasm if you work just in that area. It's so like, so sensitive for me. Remind me to send you a clip of something. Okay. 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 (laughs) 
Definitely. <laughs> Um, and then the other one was one of my favorites, mm-hmm. which can be, I think, probably combined with the massage idea is sensory deprivation, mm-hmm. um, specifically blindfolding you talked about. Yeah. Yes. When you blindfold yourself, you're taking away one sense and all the other senses get more sensitive. Uh, so especially with people who are sensualists, who are very in touch with their sense of touch and very sensitive skin, put a blindfold on them and maybe just run your fingers like this, just slowly everywhere. It will, it will excite their body in a way that you probably wouldn't be able to do without the blindfold or blindfold them. And if they're into it, consensually tie them up so they can't move put um earbuds in and play some music and then touch them um it there's so many different ways that you can play with it that will heighten the experience um and also if you just concentrate on one area of the body maybe take away those senses and just concentrate on like the top of the vulva like the mons area just massaging that or tickling that and it gets that sense of anticipation going from the person you're doing it to like touch me already put your yeah. fingers on my clit already or you know so. I was gonna I was gonna say I think that whole idea of anticipation which is you know brought on by restricting movement or sight or um sound yeah Yeah. stuff like yeah touch even like because i you think about it just in general like in life and the way that humans are wired you ever notice how like the fear of some confrontation or some big thing is worse than the actual thing that you have to deal with you know like some people say that like even like torture like the idea of torture coming you know all all your yeah is worse than the actual torture just unwrapping like the tool so i think that that obviously relates to sex as well that that whole anticipation um really riles up the the senses and so when you finally get touched and and it and it kind of like equates to two like when you know when you're in a new relationship and you're Mm -hmm. just starting to see somebody and because it's the an- anticipation, right? You, mm-hmm. You're attracted to this person. You can't wait to get there. So it kind of like almost brings that newness back into the relationship in that way. It's true. You know, I'll often tell people too who want to spark their relationship is is to try with your partner ways to seduce them, ways to um, to make them desire you or make them turn on um, as if you are trying to make love to someone you can't touch. Mm. And it puts you in a different headspace. Like, what can I do to turn this person on, but I can't touch them? And it's a really good exercise, especially during these lovely COVID times when people are having like FaceTime dates or, or whatever, um, or socially distanced dates. Like, how are you going to seduce that person? And it could, could be not just seduce for sex. It could be just, I want this person to like me. I want them to be, to desire me. How am I going to do that when I can't touch them? And you mm-hmm. get really creative. It's kind of like Little House in the Prairie. They didn't have TV, so they made their own fun. <laughs> <laughs> That's how my crazy brain works. Okay. It's, well, it's amazing uh, how how people can just be so innovative when, uh, you know, the usual options are taken away from them. Right. They come up with all the different kinds of creative ways to enjoy yourself. So, yeah, it's true. Well, thank you so much, Al. This was really, uh, this was really educational and it was (laughs) so, so great to talk about all of these things with you. Can you tell us a little bit more about your website? Um, lady cheeky. Cause I feel like we only just touched upon it kind of briefly. That's okay. It's a a sensual images site and I post things that turn me on personally. So it's a mix of um, passion and desire that I can feel through the clips and the pictures and hardcore porn because everyone has moods. Um, And I like to incorporate different body types when I can find something that is desirous with those types of body types. and it's on uh, a new platform called New Tumble. But if you go to ladycheeky.com, it'll take you there. So is it it's something that you have to log into to view yeah. everything, right? It's free. It's a blogging platform. So it's really social media. So um, I'm just reblogging from other people. I'm curating, as it were. 
Um, oh, so, yeah. I like that. That's that's a great way to describe it. Curated yeah. porn. Curated porn. Yes. Perfect. And then where can people uh, find you on social media and just basically anywhere else online if they want to learn more about you and what you do? Uh, I'm at the L chase on all the social medias and L chase.com online. Fantastic. And you guys, as always can find me at Holly Randall on Instagram and on Twitter. If you want to support this podcast, of course, go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall and filtered where you get access to tons and perks, including all of these interviews at least a week before they come out on the free platforms and of course, go to hollyrandallunfiltered.com, sign up for my monthly newsletter. And thank you guys so much for watching. And thank you, Elle, again thank for you. your time. Thanks for having me. We will see you guys next week. Manscaped is here to up your body grooming game. Their Lawnmower 3.0 is a revolutionary electric trimmer that will not only not nick or snag your nuts, but can also be used on your chest hair. If you get it in the Perfect Package 3.0, it will come with a bunch of liquid formulas to keep you feeling and smelling fresh all day. And for a limited time, you can also get a free travel bag and anti-chafing boxer briefs that come with it. So go to manscaped.com, use code HRU for 20% off plus 